Since August the 14th, over an 18-day period, U.S. military aircraft have evacuated more than 79,000 civilians from Hamid Karzai International Airport. That includes 6,000 Americans and more than 73,500 third country nationals and Afghan civilians. This last category includes special immigrant visas, consular staff, at-risk Afghans, and their families. In total, U.S. and coalition aircraft combined to evacuate more than 123,000 civilians, which were all enabled by U.S. military service members who were securing and operating the airfield. On average, we have evacuated more than 7,500 civilians per day over the 18 days of the mission, which includes 16 full days of evacuations and more than 19,000 on a single day. These numbers do not include the roughly 5,000 service members and their equipment that were sent to Afghanistan to secure the airfield and who were withdrawn at the conclusion of our mission. The numbers I provided represent a monumental accomplishment, but they do not do justice to the determination, the grit, the flexibility and the professionalism of the men and women of the U.S. military and our coalition partners who were able to rapidly combine efforts. From Afghanistan, marking the end of America's longest war, nearly 20 years now. It comes shortly after midnight in that region, where it is now August 31st, the last flight departing Afghanistan just about an hour ago. Uh, let's listen to General Frank McKenzie, head of U.S. Central Command. I'm here to announce the completion of our withdrawal from Afghanistan and the end of the military mission to evacuate American citizens, third country nationals, and vulnerable Afghans. The last C-17 lifted off from Hamid Karzai International Airport on August 30th this afternoon at 3.29 p.m. East Coast time. And the last manned aircraft is now clearing the airspace above Afghanistan. We will soon release a photo of the last C-17 departing Afghanistan with Major General Chris Donahue and the U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan, Ross Wilson, aboard. While the military evacuation is complete, the diplomatic mission to ensure additional U.S. citizens and eligible Afghans who want to leave continues. And I know that you have heard, and I know that you're going to hear more about that from the State Department shortly. Tonight's withdrawal signifies both the end of the military component of the evacuation but also the end of the nearly 20 year mission that began in Afghanistan shortly after September 11th, 2001. It's a mission that brought Osama bin Laden to a just end along with many of his Al Qaeda co-conspirators. And it was, not, it was not a cheap mission. The cost was 2,461 US service members and civilians killed and more than 20,000 who were injured. Sadly, that includes 13 US service members who were killed last week by an ISIS-K suicide bomber. We honor their sacrifice today as we remember their heroic accomplishments. No words from me could possibly capture the full measure of sacrifices uh, and accomplishments of those who served, nor the emotions they're feeling at this moment. But I will say that I'm proud that both my son and I have been a part of it. Before I open it up for questions, I do wanna provide some important context to the evacuation mission that we just completed in what was the largest non-combatant evacuation in the U.S. military's history. Since August the 14th, over an 18-day period, U.S. military aircraft have evacuated more than 79,000 civilians from Hamid Karzai International Airport. That includes 6,000 Americans and more than 73,500 third country nationals and Afghan civilians. This last category includes special immigrant visas, consular staff, at-risk Afghans and their families. In total, U.S. and coalition aircraft combined to evacuate more than 123,000 civilians, which were all enabled by U.S. military service members who were securing and operating the airfield. On average, we have evacuated more than 7,500 civilians per day over the 18 days of the mission, which includes 16 full days of evacuations and more than 19,000 on a single day. These numbers do not include the roughly 5,000 service members and their equipment that were sent to Afghanistan to secure the airfield and who were withdrawn at the conclusion of our mission. The numbers I provided represent a monumental accomplishment, but they do not do justice to the determination, the grit, the flexibility, and the professionalism of the men and women of the U.S. military and our coalition partners who were able to rapidly combine efforts and evacuate so many 
under such difficult conditions. As such, I think it's important that I provide you with what I hope will be some valuable context. When the president directed the complete withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan in April, the team at U.S. Central Command began to update and refine our existing plan for a potential non-combatant evacuation operation, or a NEO, in Afghanistan. We have a framework of plans that included numerous branches and sequels, depending on the nature of the security environment. Over time, we continued to refine our plans, which included the interagency, the international community, and other combatant commands. Plans such as this are built upon a number of facts and assumptions, and facts and assumptions change over time. While observing the security environment deteriorate, we continue to update our facts and assumptions. As the security situation rapidly devolved in Afghanistan, we took a number of actions to position ourselves for a potential NEO based upon direction from the Secretary of Defense. We positioned forces in the region and put them on increased alert. We began to pre-position supplies, and we began some preparatory work on intermediate facilities in Qatar with the support of our gracious host nation. When the evacuation was formally directed on August the 14th, we began to carry out our plan based upon the initial assumption that the Afghan security forces would be a willing and able security partner in Kabul, defending the capital for a matter of weeks or at least for a few days. Within 24 hours, of course, the Afghan military collapsed completely, opening Kabul up to the Taliban's advance. On August the 15th, in a meeting with Taliban senior leadership in Doha, I delivered a message on behalf of the president that our mission in Kabul was now the evacuation of Americans and our partners, that we would not tolerate interference, and that we would forcefully defend our forces and the evacuees if necessary. The Taliban's response in that meeting was in line with what they've said publicly. While they stated their intent to enter and occupy Kabul, they also offered to work with us on a deconfliction mechanism to prevent miscalculation while our forces operated in close quarters. Finally, they promised not to interfere with our withdrawal. It's important to understand that within 48 hours of the NEO execution order, the facts on the ground had changed significantly. We had gone from cooperating on security with a longtime partner and ally to initiating a pragmatic relationship of necessity with a longtime enemy. Into that environment, Rear Admiral Pete Vaisley and Brigadier General Farrell Sullivan of the Marines, and subsequently Major General Chris Donahue of the Army's 82nd Airborne Division, deployed and employed their forces and did extraordinary work with the leading elements of our reinforcement package to safely close the embassy in one period of darkness or one, one evening, to establish a deconfliction mechanism with the Taliban, to establish security at the airport, and to bring in the rest of our reinforcements into the airport. They accomplished this difficult list of tasks within 48 hours of supporting the transfer of the embassy to the airport. I visited Kabul on Tuesday, August the 17th to see the work being done to establish security firsthand and to observe the transition to the evacuation. I left on a C-17 that brought more than 130 Afghans and American citizens out from uh, Karzai International Airport to al Yadid Air Base in Qatar. Our men and women on the ground at the airport quickly embraced the dangerous and methodical work of defending the airport while conducting the hand-to-hand -hand screening of more than 120,000 evacuees from six different entry points under the airfield. We also conducted three separate helicopter extractions of three distinct groups of civilians, including at least 185 American citizens, and with our German partners, 21 German citizens. Additionally, U.S. Special Operations Forces reached out to help break in, bring in more than 1,064 American citizens and 2017 SIVs for Afghans at risk and 127 third country nationals all via phone calls, vectors, and escorting. We have evacuated more than 6,000 U.S. civilians, which we believe represents the vast majority of those who wanted to leave at this time. It would be difficult to overestimate the number of unusual challenges and competing demands that our forces on the ground have successfully overcome. The threat to our forces, particularly from ISIS-K, was very real and tragically resulted in the loss of 13 service members and dozens of Afghan civilians. I've said this before, but I'd like to say it again. We greatly appreciate the contributions of the many coalition partners that stood with us on the ground at, Harma, uh, at Karzai International Airport. I'm just gonna single out one nation as an example of the many. 
the Norwegians who maintained their hospital at the, at the airport and who were absolutely critical for the immediate care of our wounded after the Abbey Gate attack. Even after the attack, they agreed to extend the presence of their hospital to provide more coverage for us. Our diplomats have also been with us in Kabul from the beginning, and their work in processing over 120,000 people stands right beside that of their military partners. We were a team on the ground. As I close my remarks, I would like to offer my personal appreciation to the more than 800,000 service members and 25,000 civilians who have served in Afghanistan, and particularly to the families of those whose loved ones have been lost or wounded. Your service, as well as that of your comrades and family members, will never be forgotten. My heart is broken over the losses we sustained three days ago. As the poem by Lawrence Binion goes, we will remember them. The last 18 days have been challenging. Americans can be proud of the men and women of the armed forces who met these challenges head on. I'm now ready to take your questions. Thank you, General. We'll start uh, with the uh, lead at AP. I would ask you to, because we're limited on time, to please limit your follow-up so that uh, more people can get questions asked. Go ahead, Lita. General, thanks for doing this. It's Lita with AP. Um, can you give us a sense of whether or not there were any American citizens or other civilians who were taken out on any of those last couple of C-17s that flew out this, after, uh, this afternoon? And can you give us a picture of what you saw uh, with equipment and other things getting either destroyed or removed at the airport before they left? So we no, no American citizens came out on the last, what we call the Joint Tactical Exfiltration, the last uh, five jets to leave. Uh, we, we maintained the ability to bring them in up until immediately before departure, but we were not able to bring any Americans out. That activity ended probably about 12 hours before our exit, although we continued the outreach and would have been prepared to, to bring them on until the very last minute, but none of them made it to the airport and were able to be, and were able to be accommodated. Really? We brought some of it out and we de demilitarized some of it. Let me give you an example of something that we demilitarized. But you, you're uh, very much aware, of course, of the rocket attack that occurred yesterday where five rockets were fired at, uh, at the airfield. Our CRAMs were very effective in, uh, in engaging the two rockets that did fall on the airfield, and we believe they probably kept them from doing more significant damage. We elected to keep those systems in operation up until the very last minute. It's a complex uh, procedure, complex and time intensive procedure to break down those systems. So we demilitarized those systems so that they'll never be used again. And they were just a, 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 we felt it was more important to protect our forces than to bring those systems back. We have also demilitar demilitarized uh, equipment that we did not bring out at, uh, uh, of, of the airport that included a number of MRAPs, uh, up to um, 70 MRAPs that we demilitarized and will never be used again by anyone. 27 uh, Humvees a little tactical vehicle that will never be driven again. And additionally, uh, on the ramp at, uh, at, at H. Kaya are a total of 73 aircraft. Uh, those aircraft will never fly again uh, when we left. They'll never be, uh, be able to be operated by anyone. Most of them are non-mission capable to begin with, but certainly they'll never be able to be flown again. Thank you. David. Uh, General David Martin with CBS. Was there any attempt uh, to interfere with the final flights out, either by the Taliban or by ISIS or any other group? And did, at the end, did Americans just vacate the premises or did they turn it over to the Taliban? Oh, we know that ISIS-K has worked very, very hard to strike us and to continue to strike us. We feel that the strike we took yesterday in Kabul actually was very disruptive to their attack plans and threw them off stride. And I think that was one of the significant reasons why they were not able to organize themselves and get after us as we conducted the final withdrawal. I will tell you the Taliban have been very, pragma very pragmatic and very businesslike as we have approached this uh, withdrawal. We did not turn it over to the Taliban. Uh, General Donahue, one of the last things he did before leaving was talk to the Taliban commander that he had been coordinating with as soon as we, at about the time we were going to leave, just to let them know that we were leaving. But there was no discussion of turning anything over uh, of that at all. Jen. General McKinsey, Jennifer Griffin from Fox News. If I could just have you reflect personally, 
after 20 years of war, you've served there, you've now watched the last troops leave, you've lost troops in recent days. How did it feel leaving Afghanistan to the very group that you overthrew 20 years ago, the Taliban? Well, as I sort of said in my remarks, I, as you know, I've been there a couple times. Uh, my son's been there a couple times. Um, so, and it, it was very, uh, I was very conflicted actually, but I would tell you, I was pretty much focused on the task at hand. I'll have days ahead to actually think about that, but there was just so much going on in this headquarters and we were so completely focused on getting our troops out and in uh, the, the days before getting, uh, you know, getting, getting our citizens out and vulnerable Afghans to the best of our ability, that I did not have a lot of time for reflection. I'm sure I will do that in the future, but right now I'm pretty much consumed with the, with the operational task at hand. That's a good question, and I, and I am going to be thinking about that in the days ahead. Your message to Americans and Afghan allies who were left behind? So the military phase of this operation has ended. The diplomatic sequel to that will now begin. And I believe our Department of State is going to work very hard to allow any American citizens that are left, and we think the citizens that were not brought out number in the low, very low hundreds. Uh, I believe that we're going to work. We're going to be able to get those people out. I think we're also going to negotiate very hard and very aggressively to get our other Afghan partners out. The military phase is over, but our desire to bring these people out remains as intense as it was before. The weapons have just shifted, if you will, from the military realm to the diplomatic realm, and the Department of State will now take the lead on that. Nancy. Can you clarify just a couple points? Can you tell us how many people are on that final C-17 flight? Can you tell us where that flight is headed? And you mentioned that General Donahue talked to his Taliban, essential, essentially his counterpart. Can you give us any sense of what role the Taliban played from a security perspective to allow the U.S. to safely depart Kabul? Yeah, so I'm not going to be able to answer the first two questions because those operations are still concluding as to where the those aircraft are going and the, and the exact disposition of our forces on the aircraft. I can tell you this, though, about what the Taliban has done. They established a firm perimeter outside of the airfield to prevent people from coming on the airfield during our departure. And we've, we've worked that with them for a number of days. They did not have direct knowledge of our time of departure. We choose to keep that. We chose to keep that uh, very information very restricted but they were uh, actually very helpful and useful to us as we closed down operations. I'm going to go to the phones. I haven't done that yet. Dan Lamoth. Hey, thanks for, thanks for calling on me. Uh, General, can you, can you give us, a, a, I guess, a deeper level of detail on what this last day looked like in terms of number of flights, number of people you had on the ground to start with, um, who might have been on that last plane, particularly senior leaders, and uh, kind of just how this all played out. Thanks. Sure. So let me actually begin with the back end of your question. On the last airplane out was uh, General Chris Donahue, the commander of the 82nd Airborne Division, and my ground force commander there. And he was accompanied by our, our charge A, Ambassador Ross Wilson. So they came out together. So the state uh, and defense team came out on the last aircraft and were, in fact, the last people to stand on the ground, step on the airplane. So what has happened over the last 12 or 18 hours is, we, we first of all, we were intent on maintaining the ability to bring out uh, Americans and other, uh, and other Afghans as long as we could. So we kept that capability until just a few hours ago. And we were able to bring out some people earlier in the day, although as I've noted earlier, we had to cut it off um, sometime before this operation began. But we were intent on maintaining that capability. We were also intent on maintaining our force protection because of the, the threats from ISIS were very real, uh, very, uh, very concerning. And so we did a number of things. We had overwhelming U.S. air power overhead should there have been any uh, challenge to our departure. And again, th there was absolutely no question we were not going to be challenged by the Taliban. We were, if we were going to be challenged, it was going to be by ISIS. And I think some of the things we've done uh, yesterday, particularly the strike, and other things we've done have disrupted their ability to conduct that, uh, to conduct that attack planning. But they, may, they remain a very lethal force, and I think we would assess that Probably there are at least 2,000 hardcore ISIS fighters in Afghanistan now. And of course, many of those come from the prisons that were, that were opened a few, a few days ago. So that number is up and is probably as high as it's ever been in quite a while. And that's going to be a challenge for the Taliban, I believe, in the days ahead. Idris. Thank you, General. Uh, two quick questions. There were about 500 Afghan soldiers who were uh, protecting the perimeter. Did you evacuate them and their families? And secondly, um, just on the airport, uh, now that you've departed, do you believe 
it can uh, take on civilian aircraft pretty soon, or will it require some type of repair or expertise? Sure, so the best of my knowledge, which is actually pretty good, I believe we brought out all the Afghan uh, military forces who were partnered with us to defend the airfield and their family members. So I believe that that, that has been accomplished. Uh, we need the airport to be operational, and we need the airport to be operational quickly for civilian, you know, for civilian traffic. So we're going to do everything we can to uh, uh, to help with that. Let me give you an example. One of the things we did not demilitarize as we left were those pieces of equipment that are necessary for airport operations, such as a fire truck, some of the front end loaders, things like that. We left that we left that equipment, so that is available. Uh, to allow that airport to get back and get operating as soon as possible, and and, and it needs to get operating as soon as possible. Louis, uh, General, today is August 30th, and the deadline had repeatedly been set that it was going to be August 31st. Um, do you think that there may be some people who had some false hope that they had at least one more day before this happened? And can you explain the tactical decision as to why you uh, completed this mission on the 30th as opposed to the 31st? Sure. So it's actually the 31st in Afghanistan. As we take a look, what day of the week, what day of the month it is? It's the 30th here, 31st in Afghanistan. So we actually went out on the 31st, not the 30th. If you look at Afghan time, look, there's a lot of heartbreak associated with this departure. We did not get everybody out that we wanted to get out. But I think if we'd stayed another 10 days, Louis, we wouldn't have gotten everybody out that we wanted to get out. And there still would have been people who would have been disappointed with that. It's a it's it's a tough situation. But I want to emphasize again that simply because we have left, that doesn't mean the opportunities for both Americans that are in Afghanistan that want to leave and, uh, and Afghans who want to leave, they will not be denied that opportunity. I think our Department of State is going to work that very hard in the days and weeks ahead. Courtney. Uh, just one clarification, General McKenzie. It's Courtney QB from NBC News. Are, are, so were there any evacuees left at the airport when the last U.S. military flight left? There were no evacuees left at the airport when the U.S. last flight left, Courtney. Thank you. And then just on the Taliban, you know, you, you've, you've talked about their pragmatic ways of operating with the U.S. military here. Do you see a role for a, the U.S. military to have open conversations with the Taliban, even potential coordination going forward, in particular um, with this growing and now accentuated um, threat from ISIS? Well, I'll tell you, my, my dealing with the Taliban and uh, my, the dealings of my commanders on the ground with the Taliban revolved around our determination to execute this operation and the very flat statement we made to them that if we, you know, if you challenge us, we're going to hurt you. And I think they recognize that. And for their own purposes, this is something they wanted to have happen too. I would, I, I can't foresee the way future coordination be, between us would go. Uh, I, I would leave that for, for some future date. I will simply say that they wanted this out. We wanted to get out with our people. And with our and with our friends and partners, and so for that short period of time, our issues, our our, our view of the world was congruent. It was the same. Finally, I do believe the Taliban is going to have their hands full with ISIS K, and they let a lot of those people out of prisons, and now they're going to be able to reap what they sowed. All right, we've been listening to a briefing, a very important briefing from General Frank McKenzie, calling this, quote, the end of the nearly 20-year mission that began in Afghanistan shortly after September 11, 2001. I want to bring in NBC chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel. He's in Doha, Qatar, having been in Kabul for, for weeks now. Richard, you've been there for so long. You've covered this conflict for so long. This date, August 30th, 2021, will go down in history books as the end of this conflict. It, was, it, it will, and this was a humbling day for the United States, a day of humility for a world superpower. Afghanistan has been called the graveyard of empires. The British Empire fought in Afghanistan and withdrew in defeat. The Soviet Union occupied Afghanistan for 10 years and withdrew in defeat. The United States fought in Afghanistan for 20 years and is now, tonight, withdrawing, just completed its withdrawal in defeat. This is a, a, a difficult moment uh, for, the, for the military. I feel for the general who, who served there, uh, whose son served there. Many in the military, as he described it, are feeling tremendously conflicted. This 
withdrawal operation was conducted with great precision, uh, an extraordinary operation coordinating different air forces around the world to remove uh, more than 120,000 people from a what was effectively an island surrounded by the Taliban being attacked by ISIS. But the larger story that after 20 years, the world's, world's greatest military couldn't hold on and ultimately handed the country back to the same extremists that they had toppled just a few weeks after 9-11. And there are lessons to be learned here, and there are lessons that will be learned, and they might be learned by the wrong actors. The reason Osama bin Laden carried out the attacks of 9-11 is he was on the ground in Afghanistan, and he watched a group, a small group of Islamist fighters, defeat the Soviet Union. And he decided, he's written about it, that with enough resolve, with enough determination, with God's good graces, Islamist fighters can take on a superpower. And he took on the United States. And their next Osama bin Laden might be watching what is happening right mm -hmm. now and saying, it has happened. And, and a small Richard, group of fighters took on the United States and watched them pull out. Richard, it was striking to hear the generals say the Taliban was pragmatic and businesslike. They defended the perimeter as the U.S. was withdrawing. What happens now to the country left behind? Well, the Taliban are in charge. Afghanistan is now the Islamic Emirate run by the Taliban. The Taliban have become one of the best equipped armies in the world. That sounds strange, but the amount of hardware that they were able to seize puts them in the top, cat top categories, or top several dozen categories of best armies in the world. They will be very hard to dislodge. The United States is not going to go back in, very unlikely to go back in and drive them out again. So they're going to be there. The question is, have they learned any lesson? Will they keep their promises? The Taliban say that now, uh, after this experience, they're going to try and engage with the world. They're going to go through countries like Qatar, which are trying to nurture them and bring them and pull them into the international community. But. Can they really change? Will they change? Right now, they have been given a, lesser, a lesson in victory. And there will be many in the Taliban who say, why should we change? We have just been the way we are for the last 20 years and look at where it has brought us. It has brought us to victory. It has brought us now to the airport as they watch American forces leave. So it will be a difficult time for, for Afghanistan to come. And it particularly will be difficult for a generation. And I think that's, that's the, the biggest difference between the, what the British experience was and the, and the Soviet experience. 20 years. That means for 20 years, the United States has offered an umbrella of protection over Afghanistan. The average age in Afghanistan is 19. So most people in the country have never experienced the Taliban. They only experienced what it was like to grow up under American protection when they could hope, when they could, girls could go to school, when they could have dreams. And now that is gone, and they are experiencing a, an absolutely uncertain reality with the Taliban back in power, making promises which may or may not be kept. Richard, thank you, as ever. Uh, let me bring in NBC's chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, who's with us as well. Andrea, you heard them say the number of U.S. citizens remaining in Afghanistan, he said, is in the low hundreds. But are there still allies? Are there still people who helped the U.S. forces who remain there and can't get out? Exactly. And these Afghan translators, Afghan women journalists, Afghan lawyers and judges who had sent the Taliban to jails, uh, they are still there. And they've been desperate to get out. But the private charters, the non-government, non-profit organizations that were trying to get them out, uh, after Thursday's bombing, uh, the ISIS-K accomplished their purpose of halting access to the airport, because after that, those gates had to be closed. And what you just heard the general say is that in the last five flights, over the last 12 hours, there were no American citizens on board. They couldn't get to the airport. That transition to the airport, there were some helicopter extractions done by the military, but they could not do that after the uh, the mm -hmm. follow-on threats from ISIS-K, that there was an imminent attack. They repelled five rocket attacks just this morning. Uh, and also, of course, that drone strike yesterday. So they say, he said to just now, that that 
really did degrade ISIS-K's ability, but that's a real threat. He warned that they are going to have the, the Taliban, which he said has been helpful and useful, as you were just pointing out to Richard, that the Taliban is now going to have their hands full, because there are the highest number of ISIS fighters right now on the ground, 2,000, he said, at least 2,000, because they were released by the Taliban from the prisons. And that has proved and could prove uh, going forward to be a critical mistake, because the civil war in Afghanistan could be starting now, because the Taliban is not only going to be fighting some resistance in some provinces, some outlying provinces, from Afghans, but they are going to be fighting the ISIS-K. They're using uh, the al-Qaeda connected Haqqani network from Pakistan, who are on the ground now, as their security. But it is a, a, a stew of terror groups that are now going to be running Afghanistan. All right, Andrea Mitchell, thank you so much. Let me bring in our chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander, who's with us from the White House. Peter, I'm wondering two things. Will we hear from the president on this, uh, on this historic day? Uh, and secondly, to what Andrea just said, uh, you heard the general say over and over again, the mission will continue. The State yeah. Department will still try to get people out. But I wonder functionally how the administration plans to make that happen. No, Kate, that's a really important question. It's one, even as we were hearing from the general there, I was hearing from those who are trying, private citizens who are trying to get out Afghan allies of the United States, those former Marines, retired Marines and others who served with those allies, trying to get out those members still stuck in that country. And they were asking me, how do we do this? Where do we send them? The journey by land is simply too dangerous. So there are some real challenges right now. Right now. The United Nations earlier today acknowledging that the plight in many ways for those Afghan civilians is just beginning. The refugee crisis, the humanitarian crisis associated with that is still a significant issue that the Biden administration is going to have to deal with right now as it tries to resettle so many of the tens of thousands of those who they were able to get out over the course of the last several days and weeks. As it relates to the president himself, uh, his public schedule is effectively closed for the day. They announced what they call a lid, which means we are not expected to hear or see from him today. It's, it's likely that we would hear uh, in the form of a statement released from the White House. Jen Psaki, the press secretary, earlier saying that President Biden would address the end of this war in the coming days, to use her words. But as we come to the end of a 20-year war, what to so many wasn't just America's longest war, but also a forgotten war, it has certainly not been forgotten to the more than 2,400 American service members who lost their lives, including those 13 who lost their lives in the last several days. As I've been, uh, we've been hearing from the family members, so many of them. The average age of those 13 who lost their lives, Kate, was just 22. Many of them just 20 years old, meaning they were just infant, infants, barely born just after 9-11 when American troops first arrived in Afghanistan, Kate. That's uh, some perspective there, Peter. Thank you so much. We're also, of course, keeping a close eye on another large story today. We did see the president being briefed by FEMA and governors earlier because of Hurricane Ida, one of the strongest storms to ever hit the U.S. Search and rescue operations still underway. Louisiana's governor earlier calling the damage catastrophic. Let's go to NBC's Tom Yamas. He's there for an update in New Orleans. Tom, what are we seeing now? Now. Well, Kate, I can tell you that New Orleans and Louisiana are hurting right now and they need help. There are pockets of destruction like this you see behind me, but the real damage is to the infrastructure here in New Orleans. More than a million people right now have no power throughout the Gulf Coast because of Hurricane Ida, and they've been told it's going to take weeks to repair. We were just out at a giant electrical tower, probably 10 stories high, Kate. It's collapsed. It has several feeder lines, and many people believe this could possibly be the epicenter of the power problem in New Orleans, and there's absolutely nothing left of this tower. I was out with some power crews earlier today as they were being briefed, and we were told, and they were told, I should say, I heard their manager talking to them saying it's going to be a marathon. On, not a sprint. So people are being told they're not going to have any power, any electricity, any AC, any cell phone service for possibly weeks, still in the middle of summer here in New Orleans when it's very hot. We were at Laplace, which possibly could be ground zero for Hurricane Ida. People have lost everything there, Kate. We were with a mother. She has seven children, and she's pregnant. She says her house was completely flooded. She has no money, no food, and she was begging the governor for help. They really need help right now in Laplace. We're going to be bringing you all these stories on Nightly News, and it's not just around the greater New Orleans area. It's places like Homa as well, where hospitals had to be evacuated, those patients being brought here to New Orleans. We also spoke with a nurse, a NICU nurse, 
who stayed with several babies throughout the storm. Their parents had to evacuate, so these nurses at the hospital stayed with these children and gave the parents updates as the hurricane was hitting New Orleans, one of the most powerful storms to ever hit the United States. We're going to have a full wrap-up of the latest on Hurricane Ida and why New Orleans right now, tonight, is hurting so much. Kate? And, Tom, we're also seeing flooding in other parts of the state, even search and rescue, as I said, continuing at this hour. That's right. The water levels rose. You know, the levee system, for the most part, withstood Hurricane Ida, unlike what happened in Katrina 16 years ago. But the problem was the storm surge was so high in some areas that some of the levees were overtopped and the water came in. Places like Laplace, places like Grand Isle that are right on the Gulf Coast, that water just came right in and people did need to be rescued. A lot of our team saw these rescues as they were happening. 1,500 National Guard troops have been dispatched to Louisiana to help with the problem right now, and we hope they get to every single person. Okay. All right, Tom, thank you again. Two major stories this afternoon. We came on the air to tell you about the end of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan after nearly 20 years. And again, Tom will have much more tonight when he anchors a special edition of NBC Nightly News from New Orleans, talking about the hurricane there. For the latest, you can also head to NBCNews.com and MSNBC. I'm Kate Snow, NBC News, New York. Santa opposite Will Ferrell in Elf. Santa! Back off, Slick. I realized I was a better... Than 123,000 people have been safely flown out of Afghanistan. That includes about 6,000 American citizens. This has been a massive military, diplomatic, and humanitarian undertaking. One of the most difficult in our nation's history. And an extraordinary feat of logistics and coordination under some of the most challenging circumstances imaginable. Many, many people made this possible. I want to commend our outstanding diplomats who worked around the clock and around the world to coordinate the operation. They volunteered for duty at the Kabul airport. They flew to transit countries to help process thousands of Afghans bound for the United States. They deployed to ports of entry and American military bases to welcome Afghans to their new homes. They staffed a 24-7 task force here in Washington, overseen by Deputy Secretary Brian McKeon. And they built a list of Americans possibly seeking to leave Afghanistan, then worked to contact every single one of them repeatedly, making 55,000 phone calls, sending 33,000 emails since August 14th. They solved problem after problem to keep the mission moving forward. They did this because for the thousands of State Department and USAID employees who served in Afghanistan in the past 20 years, this evacuation operation was very personal. Many worked hand in hand for years with Afghan partners, many of whom became trusted friends. We also lost cherished members of our foreign service community in Afghanistan. We'll never forget them. Helping Americans, our foreign partners who've been by our side for 20 years, and Afghans at risk at this critical moment was more than just a high-stakes assignment for our team. It was a sacred duty. And the world saw how our diplomats rose to the challenge with determination and heart. U.S. service members in Kabul did heroic work, securing the airport, protecting civilians of many nationalities, including tens of thousands of Afghans, and airlifting them out. They're also providing vital support right now, caring for Afghans on military bases in Europe, the Middle East, and here in the United States. We've seen pictures of U.S. service members at the Kabul airport cradling babies, comforting families. That's the kind of compassionate courage our men and women in uniform exemplify. They carried out this mission under the constant threat of terrorist violence. And four days ago, 11 Marines one Navy medic and one soldier were killed by a suicide bomber at the airport gate, as well as scores of Afghans. Nearly all of them were in their early 20s, just babies or toddlers on September 11, 2001. These deaths are a devastating loss for our country. We at the State Department feel them deeply. We have a special bond with the Marines. The first person that you see when you visit an American embassy is a Marine. 
They guard our diplomatic missions. They keep us safe around the world. We couldn't do our jobs without them. And we will never forget their sacrifice, nor will we forget what they achieved. The most exceptional among us perform a lifetime's work of service in a short time here on Earth. So it was for our exceptional brothers and sisters who died last week. Finally, I want to thank our allies and partners. This operation was a global endeavor in every way. Many countries stepped up with robust contributions to the airlift, including working by our side at the airport. Some are now serving as transit countries, allowing evacuees to be registered and processed on the way to their final destinations. Others have agreed to re resettle Afghan refugees permanently, and we hope more will do so in the days and weeks ahead. We're truly grateful for their support. Now, U.S. military flights have ended, and our troops have departed Afghanistan. A new chapter of America's engagement with Afghanistan has begun. It's one in which we will lead with our diplomacy. The military mission is over. A new diplomatic mission has begun. So here's our plan for the days and weeks ahead. First, we built a new team to help lead this new mission. As of today, we've suspended our diplomatic presence in Kabul and transferred our operations to Doha, Qatar, which will soon be formally notified to Congress. Given the uncertain security environment and political situation in Afghanistan, it was the prudent step to take. And let me take this opportunity to thank our outstanding Chargé d'Affaires in Kabul, Ambassador Ross Wilson, who came out of retirement in January 2020 to lead our embassy in Afghanistan and has done exceptional, courageous work during a highly challenging time. For the time being, we will use this post in Doha to manage our diplomacy with Afghanistan including consular affairs, administering humanitarian assistance, and working with allies, partners, and regional and international stakeholders to coordinate our engagement and messaging to the Taliban. Our team there will be led by Ian McCarry, who served as our Deputy Chief of Mission in Afghanistan for this past year. No one's better prepared to do the job. Second, we will continue our relentless efforts to help Americans, foreign nationals, and Afghans leave Afghanistan if they choose. Let me talk briefly about the Americans who remain in Afghanistan. We made extraordinary efforts to give Americans every opportunity to depart the country, in many cases talking and sometimes walking them into the airport. Of those who self-identified as Americans in Afghanistan who are considering leaving the country, we've thus far received confirmation that about 6,000 have been evacuated or otherwise departed. This number will likely continue to grow as our outreach and arrivals continue. We believe there are still a small number of Americans, under 200 and likely closer to 100, who remain in Afghanistan and want to leave. We're trying to determine exactly how many. We're going through manifests and calling and texting through our lists, and we'll have more details to share as soon as possible. Part of the challenge with fixing a precise number is that there are long-time residents of Afghanistan who have American passports and who were trying to determine whether or not they wanted to leave. Many are dual citizen Americans with deep roots and extended families in Afghanistan who have resided there for many years. For many, it's a painful choice. Our commitment to them and to all Americans in Afghanistan and everywhere in the world continues. The protection and welfare of Americans abroad remains the State Department's most vital and enduring mission. If an American in Afghanistan tells us that they want to stay for now, and then in a week or a month or a year, they reach out and say, I've changed my mind, we will help them leave. Additionally, we've worked intensely to evacuate and relocate Afghans who worked alongside us and are at particular risk of reprisal. We've gotten many out but many are still there. We will keep working to help them. Our commitment to them has no deadline. Third, we will hold the Taliban to its pledge to let people freely depart Afghanistan. The Taliban is committed to let anyone with proper documents leave the country in a safe and orderly manner. They've said this privately and publicly many times. 
On Friday, a senior Taliban official said it again on television and radio, and I quote, any Afghans may leave the country, including those who work for Americans, if they want and for whatever reason there may be, end quote. More than half the world's countries have joined us in insisting that the Taliban let people travel outside Afghanistan freely. As of today, more than 100 countries have said that they expect the Taliban to honor travel authorizations by our countries. And just a few short hours ago, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution that enshrines that responsibility, laying the groundwork to hold the Taliban accountable if they renege. So the international chorus on this is strong, and it will stay strong. We will hold the Taliban to their commitment on freedom of movement for foreign nationals, visa holders, at-risk Afghans. Fourth, we will work to secure their safe passage. This morning, I met with the foreign ministers of all the G7 countries, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Canada, Italy, Japan, as well as Qatar, Turkey, the European Union, and the Secretary General of NATO. We discussed how we will work together to facilitate safe travel out of Afghanistan, including by reopening Kabul's civilian airport as soon as possible. And we very much appreciate the efforts of Qatar and Turkey in particular to make this happen. This would enable a small number of daily charter flights, which is a key for anyone who wants to depart from Afghanistan moving forward. We're also working to identify ways to support Americans, legal permanent residents, and Afghans who have worked with us and who may choose to depart via overland routes. We have no illusion that any of this will be easy or rapid. This will be an entirely different phase from the evacuation that just concluded. It will take time to work through a new set of challenges, but we will stay at it. John Bass, our former ambassador to Afghanistan, who returned to Kabul two weeks ago to help lead our evacuation efforts at the airport, will spearhead our ongoing work across the State Department to help American citizens and permanent residents, citizens of allied nations, special immigrant visa applicants, and Afghans at high risk if any of those people wish to depart Afghanistan. We're deeply grateful for all that John did in Kabul for his, commit uh, and for his continued uh, co commitment to this mission, as well as the extraordinary consular officers who were serving by his side. Fifth, we will stay focused on counterterrorism. The Taliban has made a commitment to prevent terrorist groups from using Afghanistan as a base for external operations that could threaten the United States or our allies, including al-Qaeda and the Taliban's sworn enemy, ISIS-K. Here, too, we will hold them accountable to that commitment. But while we have expectations of the Taliban, that doesn't mean we will rely on the Taliban. We'll remain vigilant in monitoring threats ourselves, and we'll maintain robust counterterrorism capabilities in the region to neutralize those threats if necessary as we demonstrated in the past few days by striking ISIS facilitators and imminent threats in Afghanistan, and as we do in places around the world where we do not have military forces on the ground. Let me speak directly to our engagement with the Taliban across these and other issues. We engaged with the Taliban during the past few weeks to enable our evacuation operations. Going forward, any engagement with a Taliban-led government in Kabul will be driven by one thing only our vital national interests. If we can work with a new Afghan government in a way that helps secure those interests, including the safe return of Mark Freerichs, a U.S. citizen who's been held hostage in the region since early last year, and in a way that brings greater stability to the country and region and protects the gains of the past two decades, we will do it. But we will not do it on the basis of trust or faith. Every step we take will be based not on what a Taliban-led government says, but what it does to live up to its commitments. The Taliban seeks international legitimacy and support. Our message is any legitimacy and any support will have to be earned. The Taliban can do that by meeting commitments and obligations on freedom of travel, respecting the basic rights of the Afghan people, including women and minorities, upholding its commitments on counterterrorism, not carrying out reprisal violence against those who choose to stay in Afghanistan, and forming an inclusive government that can meet the needs and reflect the aspirations of the Afghan people. Sixth, we will continue our humanitarian assistance to the people of Afghanistan. 
The conflict has taken a terrible toll on the Afghan people. Millions are internally displaced. Millions are facing hunger, even starvation. The COVID-19 pandemic has also hit Afghanistan hard. The United States will continue to support humanitarian aid to the Afghan people. Consistent with our sanctions on the Taliban, the aid will not flow, flow through the government, but rather through independent organizations, such as UN agencies and NGOs. And we expect that those efforts will not be impeded by the Taliban or anyone else. And seventh, we will continue our broad international diplomacy across all these issues and many others. We believe we can accomplish far more and exert far greater leverage when we work in coordination with our allies and partners. Over the last two weeks, we've had a series of intensive diplomatic engagements with allies and partners to plan and coordinate the way ahead in Afghanistan. I've met with the foreign ministers of NATO in the G7. I've spoken one-on-one -on -one with dozens of my counterparts. Last week, President Biden met with the leaders of the G7 countries, and Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman has been convening a group of 28 allies and partners from all regions of the world every other day. Going forward, we'll coordinate closely with countries in the region and around the world, as well as with leading international organizations, NGOs, and the private sector. Our allies and partners share our objectives and are committed to working with us. I'll have more to say on these matters in the coming days. The main point I want to drive home here today is that America's work in Afghanistan continues. We have a plan for what's next. We're putting it into action. This moment also demands reflection. The war in Afghanistan was a 20-year endeavor. We must learn its lessons and allow those lessons to shape how we think about fundamental questions of national security and foreign policy. We owe that to future diplomats, policymakers, military leaders, service members. We owe that to the American people. But as we do, we will remain relentlessly focused on today and on the future. We'll make sure we're finding every opportunity to make good on our commitment to the Afghan people, including by welcoming thousands of them into our communities, as the American people have done many times before, with generosity and grace throughout our history. In this way, we'll honor all those brave men and women from the United States and many other countries who risked or sacrificed their lives as part of this long mission right up to today. Thanks for listening. Mr. Did this administration break its word that no American would be left behind? Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. America's longest war now over. Every single U.S. service member is out of Afghanistan. What else the Pentagon is saying about their departure? Chicago students back at school today, but some of them had a hard time getting there. We'll show you why. 